Hello everyone and welcome to the guest lecture on lake hydrology. My name is Zahidul Islam and I am from the Water and West Policy Branch of Alberta Environment and Parks. I've been delivering this lecture for the last few years in person. This year, however, is different, so I'm video recording this lecture and uploading into YouTube. If you have any comments or questions, you can send me an email. You can also post your comments in the YouTube video. The most important component of lake hydrology is lake water balance. In this lecture, I will try to explain you why you need to learn lake water balance and how you will learn lake water balance. The lecture is divided into three parts. In part one, you will learn the basic theory of lake hydrology. In part two, you will learn about different data source and methods to estimate different components of lake hydrology. And in the last and final part, you will see an example of lake water balance calculation for a lake in Alberta. Hope this lecture will be useful for you. And thanks for watching. Let's start with why we need to know lake water balance or lake hydrology. From water management point of view, we need to know how much water is actually available in a lake or in a wetland. Also, all water in Alberta is regulated and allocated by the Crown. So when someone apply for diverting water from a lake or from a wetland, we need to assess is there any potential adverse effect to the aquatic environment because of that diversion. Also, often we need to develop water policy in the province. For example, how much water can be allocated sustainably and without adverse impact to ecological needs. Now, the question is how we actually estimate the lake water balance. As you can see, this is a 3D diagram of a lake in Alberta. So there are basically three components in a lake water balance. So the first component is how much water is actually coming into the lake. We call it incoming water. And then the second thing is how much water is going out of the lake, which is outgoing water. Now, depending on the value of incoming water and outgoing water, there will be a change in stories into the lake. It could be positive, it could be negative. So in part one, we will explore different theoretical background of lake water balance, specifically different components of lake water balance. Let's explore the incoming water sources. Basically, there are four different water sources. The first one is precipitation that is falling over the lake surface. The second thing is the surface runoff that is coming from the lake watershed. So every lake has a watershed, which is a certain area from where the runoff is coming into the lake. So we need to estimate how much surface runoff is coming from that watershed. The third component is the return flow. So as I mentioned before, when someone apply for a water license to divert water from a lake, often the license also comes with an amount of return flow that is supposed to be diverted back into the water body. So that's the return flow. And then the fourth component is the groundwater inflow. So the groundwater that is coming into the lake. Now let's explore a little bit about what exactly we mean by a lake watershed. So the general definition of a watershed is an area of land that drains into a lake or a river. For example, in this slide, you can see this blue area, that's the ghost lake. And basically these are all the tributary that is coming from different parts of the watershed into the ghost lake. So basically any precipitation, any surface runoff happening in this area is basically coming into this lake. So this is what the watershed is, looks like for the ghost lake. Now, when you see a lake watershed in Prairie, things are a little bit different. For example, this is a lake watershed for Wizard Lake 
and you can see it's a very, very flat ground and the watershed is, is quite small compared to the Ghost Lake. Now, why we need to know lake watershed area? Now, there's something we call lake sustainability. Let's explore some numbers. So in Alberta, in an annual scale, precipitation amount is around 500 millimeter. The shallow lake evaporation, which is one form of lake evaporation, it's about 677 millimeter. So you can see the incoming water that coming into a lake from precipitation is 500 and the outgoing water that going out of the lake in form of evaporation is 675. So basically our precipitation is less than evaporation. That means there's a deficit in water balance in a lake. So usually that deficit is filled by the surface runoff that is coming from the watershed area into the lake. So more watershed area you have, that mean more runoff coming into the lake, that mean the lake is much more sustained and vice versa. So if your lake has a small watershed area, that means small runoff will be coming into the lake, that means the lake will be less sustained in future. Also, from the water quality point of view, lake watershed area is very important because lake watershed area is the area from where all the water quality parameters like you know nutrients or sediments is coming into the lake. And also, in order to see that how land use is changing the lake hydrology, you need to know what is the lake watershed area is. Now, how do you determine a lake watershed? So, you know, uh, there are some process, it starts from the digital elevation model. And nowadays you can do everything in actually geographic information system or GIS. For example, let's explore how do we delineate lake watershed for a lake. So this is Laser Slip Lake in Alberta. And this is the digital elevation model of the surrounding area of that lake. So from the digital elevation model in GIS, you can actually estimate which way the flow is going. So basically there are eight types of flow direction and you can estimate if a drop of water falls into one of those pixels, which way the water will go. From the flow direction, you basically find out flow accumulation. So this white shaded lines or channels are showing where all the water from this area is basically accumulating. And from that, you can estimate the detailed drainage network like this. And you can estimate small catchment area. And from there, you can actually find out what is the watershed area for that lake. Now, the last component is the groundwater inflow into the lake. Now, lake interaction with groundwater is a little bit different. So there are three types of lake available, gaining lake, losing lake, and flow through lake. So gaining lake is where basically a lake receives water from groundwater. So you can see groundwater from around the lake is coming into the lake. For a losing lake, the water actually going out of the lake through groundwater flow. And it also depends on the water table. For example, for a gaining lake, you'd see that the water level outside the lake is higher than the lake surface. So there's a gradient working and water is coming from this area into the lake. For a losing lake, usually the groundwater table outside the lake is lower than the lake surface. So there's a gradient working that way and the lake is losing water. And often the flow through lake where, you know, the incoming water and outgoing water is almost same. So basically the water will flow from one direction to other directions through the lake. Now, one particular lake can be gaining and losing depending on the season, right? So often when it's the wet season, basically the groundwater level could be higher and the lake could be gaining water. 
and when it's dry season then the reverse could be happening now let's have a look on the outgoing water sources so we have four types of water sources as outgoing water. So the first one is evaporation from a lake surface. And we'll know a little bit about more about the evaporation. The second component is outflow from a lake to the downstream channel. So often our lakes are connected to channels, downstream and upstream. And your lake can actually be draining water downstream. So we need to know how much water is actually leaving the system through a downstream channel. The third component is, as I mentioned earlier, that often we use water from a lake. For example, a municipality can withdraw water from a lake for municipal water purpose or for uh, any other industry or agricultural users can divert water from a lake. So we need to know how much water is actually being diverted from that lake. And the last thing is again, the groundwater outflow. So just like the groundwater inflow, your lake can lose water through groundwater outflow from the system. So let's explore a little bit about the evapotranspiration. Now evapotranspiration is a combination of two things, the evaporation and the transpiration. So evaporation is liquid water that is usually converted to water vapor um, and removed from the evaporating surface. So there's the water loss coming out of the open water. At the same time, you know, there are transpiration, which is basically water loss from plants through small openings found on the underside of leaves. So that basically the water loss through the plant surface. And evapotranspiration, when we use this term, we basically refer uh, a combination of these two things. Okay, so let's have a look. What are the factors that can impact evaporation? So the first thing is definitely the wind. So if you have a higher wind above a lake surface, you would expect more evaporation happening and vice versa. The second thing is the, the radiative force or the temperature. So higher temperature cause higher evaporation and lower temperature cause lower evaporation. So you'd expect more evaporation happening in summer and less in winter. And then the humidity. So if the air above the lake surface is humid, you would expect less evaporation. And if air above the lake surface is dry, you would expect more evaporation. Now, there are different types of evaporation. So one of the things we call potential evaporation, you know, so it's basically evaporation that is happening from a water body. Uh, where there's no constraint on the supply of moisture. So it's a sort of theoretical estimation of how much water can be lost from a water body. And then we have the lake evaporation. So basically in a lake environment, we actually use two terms. One is a shallow lake evaporation and one is a deep lake evaporation. So when a lake is, is a shallow, it's not that much deep. So basically uh, that's when you'd expect to have shallow lake evaporation. Now, if your lake is deeper, then what happened basically in summer times, the lake's water actually absorb energy and then it actually release a little bit later time. So basically in an annual scale, the shallow lake evaporation and deep lake evaporation, the amount is same. However, the distribution of evaporation in different months uh, would be a little bit different. Then we also use the gross evaporation. So that's the total actual water loss from a large water body. We also often use a term, it's called the net evaporation. So if you subtract the precipitation from a large water body from the gross evaporation, so that's the net evaporation for that water body. And then there are different types of evapotranspiration as well. Uh, so the first one is the potential evapotranspiration, which is again the theoretical maximum possible evapotranspiration from a terrestrial surface when there is no constraint in supply of moisture. However, in reality, um, the actual evapotranspiration is much, much lower than the potential evapotranspiration. And often we use the term like aerial evapotranspiration, which is again uh, the actual evapotranspiration from a large area. Now, in this demonstration, 
I'm showing different types of evaporation from terrestrial and also from the water surface. You can see evaporation is happening from soil, evaporation is happening from lake, um, from streams, uh, also from canopy, from vegetation. So basically um, everything, when you combine everything, that's the, the potential or actual evapotranspiration from a large surface. And if you just consider the lakes or the streams, those are the lake evaporation. Now let's see that how evaporation and evapotranspiration happening in Alberta. What is the amount of that? In Alberta, in an annual basis, the mean annual precipitation is about 502 millimeter. However, when that amount of precipitation falls into the surface runoff, um, it only generates the 98 millimeter of surface runoff. So where the, the rest of the things go? The rest of the things, uh, one of the component is the 14 millimeter that actually coming as a deeper groundwater fall. And the rest, which is about 373 millimeter of water is actually leaving the system as evapotranspiration. So you can see it's about like three fourth of the precipitation. This is why evapotranspiration is very important in order to estimate lake water balance. Now, as a department, what we do, we actually estimate evaporation and evapotranspiration in 20 different stations in Alberta. You can see the station's name are in the x-axis. And you can see four types of bar chart here. So this one is potential evaporation. And then the blue one is shallow lake evaporation. The yellow one is potential evapotranspiration. And the light sky blue is the actual evapotranspiration. You can see that the numbers varies stations to stations. You can see if you go further south, the numbers are a little bit higher. If you go further north, the numbers are lower. And also comparing to these four types of evaporation and evapotranspiration, you can see the highest number is the potential evaporation. The lowest number is actual evapotranspiration. Now, how do you estimate the changes in stories in a lake? For example, uh, let's, this is a time t, it goes to zero. So that's probably the beginning of the time. And then you need to know how things are happening at a later time, which is t equals to small t. And for example, when time is zero, this is where your lake level is, right? Now, in order to know the changes in lake stories, you need to know the lake incoming water and also you need to know the outgoing water. For example, if your incoming water is greater than the outgoing water, you would expect that your lake level will be higher than what you had at time equals to zero. And in reverse, if your incoming water is less than the outgoing water, that means you would expect your lake level will be go down in a time later than the time equals to zero. Now, in order to get this information, what would be the new water level of a lake, you also need some other information. So one of the thing we called it area capacity curve, which is again, a relationship of the volume of the lake with elevation. So for example, this is a area capacity curves of a lake that's showing what is the lake volume with different elevation. Now, for example, you know the lake level at t equals to zero. From there, you actually know what is the volume of water in the lake. And then if you know that how much is the incoming water and how much is the outgoing water, you actually estimate what would be the volume of that lake at a time equals to t. And from there, you come to the curve and you get what would be the estimated lake elevation at time equals to t. 
So this is an example of lake level for a skeletal lake. And so you basically have to monitor lake levels uh, in order to know um, the, the lake water balance. So it's very important to know what is the lake level so that you can estimate lake level and then you can verify um, those estimated lake levels against the measured numbers. Now, this is an example of Mural Lake in Alberta. You can see this is a 3D diagram of Mural Lake. And uh, basically, you can see two types of curve here. One is the capacity, which is the volume, and the second one is the area. So basically, it's showing that how, you know, capacity and area is changing with depth or elevation. So in a summary, you know, we already discussed about these three different types of components. So the first thing, you know, in coming water, we have the precipitation that falling on the lake surface. You also can see the surface inflow that coming into the lake, which is the surface runoff from lake watershed. You could expect groundwater inflow depending on your lake is gaining or losing. From the outgoing side, you also have evaporation from a lake surface. You'd expect um, there could be a surface outflow. And also often, you know, um, we use net diversion, which is again, you know, how much water is diverting from a lake and then how much water is coming into the lake as a return flow. So the difference is the net diversion. And then you'd expect groundwater outflow for some times. So basically what this equation is showing you, this is the incoming component of the water balance. This is the outgoing component of the water balance. So basically, if you estimate the rate and the difference, that will give you the rate of change of volume or storage in the lake. In part two, we'll try to explore how do you estimate different components of the lake water balance that we just explained in part one? So we'll try to find out the different data sources and different methods to estimate all those components of incoming water, outgoing water, and also the rate of change of storage. So the first thing is precipitation. Usually the main source of data of precipitation in Canada is Environmental Climate Change Canada website. So the URL of the website is over here. You can also Google just Environmental Climate Change Canada precipitation data. And you can download station observation from this website. In Alberta, the Alberta Climate Information Services, which is again a combination of data from Environmental Climate Change Canada and also from Alberta Environment and Alberta Agriculture and Forestry. You can actually go to this website and you can download precipitation observation at different point of the province. Now, often precipitation data is not continuous. So there are gaps in data and often that can create a problem at the user end to analyze those precipitation data. In order to avoid those issues, uh, Alberta Climate Information Service also provide gridded gap-free daily climate data at about 6,800 townships in Alberta. You can see this is the covers of climate information, including precipitation. And those small squares are actually one township. And this is just a zoom version of one specific township. So you can actually go to this website and you can download data from there in a daily scale from 1961 to present. The next component is surface runoff from a lake watershed. Now, for example, this is Pigeon Lake and this whole area bounded by the red line is the watershed area of this lake. Now, surface runoff from a lake watershed estimation could be a little bit complicated. So definitely, you know, the best option could be 
to develop a hydrology model for the lake watershed. Look at different components of hydrology like you know evaporation, precipitation, snow melt, all those components, and you can actually estimate how much water is coming from that lake watershed into the lake. And depending on the complexity of your project, you could develop simple hydrologic model using different tools like HAKE, HMS, or HSPF, or other simple hydrologic model. Or you can actually develop complex hydrologic model like SWOT or Mike Shi. The, the challenge that we always face that although you can develop hydrologic model, but at the end of the day, you actually have to calibrate those model according to the measured numbers, and often those numbers are not available. So another way to estimate uh, surface runoff is, you know, there are monitoring stations available where, you know, either Water Survey of Canada or even Alberta Environment, they actually measure surface runoff from water body and lakes. And you can actually use some of those station information to estimate how much surface runoff is coming from that lake watershed. For example, you know, this is a skeleton lake and I'll give a little bit more elaborated version of this example in the part three of this presentation. So skeleton lake has a watershed area bounded by this purple line. And we need to estimate how much water is actually coming into this lake from this watershed area. However, there is no monitoring station available in this watershed. But we can see there are uh, a monitoring station available nearby over here, which is Flat Lake, right? So what you can do, you can you know estimate uh, the surface runoff for the skeleton lake using that station data. So you need to know what is the flow of that lake watershed. You also need to know what is the watershed area of that lake. And then you can divide it, find out a ratio, and then you can multiply it with the watershed area of skeletal lake. And often you need a sort of calibration factor now, for groundwater inflow and outflow, again, the best option is to develop a surface water groundwater interaction model, which is very, very complicated. However, there are indirect methods available. For example, um, I'm going to explore one specific method that we have used for one of the lake. Uh, think about the water balance of a lake during winter time. So there is no uh, or very little evaporation happening because the lake is covered with snow, right? So the evaporation component would be zero. And usually there is no surface runoff coming into the lake during winter because everything is frozen. So the only thing that can change a lake level is, you know, the ground or inflow or outflow and also the load of snow that is coming from the top. So you could actually develop a conceptual model to estimate groundwater flux in the lake based on you know, the changes in lake level elevation and also you know, how much snow is falling on the top of the lake. Now, there are different methods available for evaporation estimate. And we can group them into like four broader category, like energy balance, vapor transfer. And often we use a combination of energy transfer uh, and vapor transfer. And then there are like complementary relationship based model available. So this is again, you know, different types of uh, model and then the name of those models. Um, in Alberta, as a department, we actually use Morton's evaporation model. Um, Alberta Environment and Parks have been, you know, using Morton's model for quite a long time. You could actually go to this website, this link, and you can download reports for evaporation and evapotranspiration in Alberta. And we actually provide data, estimated Morton's model evaporation data for these 20 locations in Alberta. And 
Recently, that model has been incorporated into the ACIS system. So you can go to this website and you can actually go to um, derivatives section and you can actually download those models evaporation results from the website directly. So the next thing is water diversion, which is how much water is being diverted, um, you know, for any sort of water uses like municipality or irrigation or industrial. So in order to know that, you need to know about two important things. So one is the water allocation and then one is water use. Now, when someone wanted to use water for any purpose like municipal or industrial or, or irrigation, they actually apply for a water diversion to uh, Alberta Environment and Parks or Alberta Energy Regulator, depending on the types of water use. And they actually provide how much water they are planning to divert for their purpose. So that's the, basically that's the theoretical water diversion and we call it as a water allocation. And often it includes the volume and also the rate and also, you know, the timing of the diversion that when they wanted to divert that water. Now, often what happened, the amount of water actually being diverted is uh, less than what is the license amount, which is the water allocation. So basically water use is the volume that actually being diverted and consumed. So just to be mindful of that, that water allocation is not water use. Water use is usually less than water allocation. Now, the amount of water that is being diverting, you could actually get that information from um, authorization viewer. So you can go to this website. And if you search by the water body, it will bring all the information of how much amount of water is allocated for the water body. The water use information, however, is not available publicly. However, you can send an email to this email address and you can request if there are any water use data available for that lake or river. Okay, now let's explore the outflow component of the water balance. So the first thing we need to know is about the surface outflow from a lake. For example, this is Pigeon Lake again. This is the watershed area, and you can see there's a channel going out of that lake. So if there's a monitoring station available, you can actually estimate how much water is going out of the system. Often you don't see any you know, measurement stations downstream of a lake. So in that case, you actually have to uh, apply some sort of, you know, uh, outflow structures to estimate how much flow is leaving the system. We also need lake level data. So basically there are two sources of lake level in Alberta. One is again, the Water Survey of Canada historical data. So you can actually go to the Water Survey of Canada website and you can download uh, lake level data for some lakes. And then there are some lakes which we don't have data through Water Survey of Canada. And you actually have to send an email to this email address to get some of the lake level data. And those lakes are being monitored under miscellaneous streams and lake level. And then also you can go to uh, Atlas of Alberta Lakes, this website, and actually it has information on about 100 lakes in Alberta. And you can see that it will also have information on lake levels. Okay, now let's explore a little bit on the area capacity curves. So I think I explained it before that area capacity curves are actually two set of curves that gives you information on the surface area and volume of a lake with water level. Now, there are different sources of area capacity curves available in Alberta. So the first source is again, the Atlas of Alberta Lakes, this book, and this is available now through this website. And there are information on about 100 lakes in that source. And I think right now they have about 79 
AV capacity curves available through their website. The problem is, you know, there is no tabular data available. And then there are data available through archive files in Alberta Environment and Parks. So these are basically the original area capacity calculations based on the bathymetric survey of various lakes. And you can also go to Alberta Geologic Survey uh, through this link. And basically they have digital bathymetry data for about 169 lakes. And you can actually use GIS to develop area capacity curves from those bathymetry. So a few years ago, what we have initiated is, you know, basically we try to combine all these three different sources and we start reconstructing area capacity curves for Alberta. Now, another important information is necessary that, okay, you know, um, have you seen that they, we need area capacity curves for various lakes, uh, but in order to get area capacity curves, you need, to need bathymetric survey. Now, we only have bathymetric survey available for about 169 lakes in Alberta, but there are like lakes, you know, available everywhere. So how do you estimate volume and depth relationship when no bathymetric data is available? So recently we have done um, some applied research on this and, you know, the, the study findings is available through Canadian Journal of Civil Engineering and you can go and download the paper over here. But what we explored that, you know, Alberta lakes, they are different and they have different shapes, right? So you can see these are real um, bathymetric survey. And what we have done, we basically just, you know, change the scale of the Y axis or the, the depth so that you can actually see some of those shapes. But, you know, some of our lakes are very, very, you know, narrow, like Ethel Lake. And some of our lakes are very, very wide like Gull Lake. And basically what we have done, we try to develop a sort of idealized shape of a lake. And from there, we actually try to uh, conceptualize that, you know, there could be different types of lake, like inverse parabolic, conic, parabolic, sort of parabolic and cylindrical. And then, you know, we done some theoretical analysis and we find out that, you know, we can actually estimate lake volume from lake shape using some equations. And depending on different shape of a lake, those numbers could be different. And then there are some lakes, you know, where you should have no information available about shapes. Um, so what you can do, the minimum information you can gather is the lake surface area from, you know, satellite images or Google Earth images. So we also try to develop some relationship between lake surface area and lake volume. And the relationship looks pretty good. You can see these dots are real numbers. And this firm, Maroon line is showing the relationship between the surface area and the volume. And you can also see how uncertain those estimates are. So this dotted line is showing you the 95% confidence interval. And you can also see some statistical numbers showing that how good is that relationship. So the first step is to estimate maximum volume from maximum surface area using a regression formula over here based on that research. So you can easily estimate a maximum surface area of a lake from Google Earth or any other satellite imagery. And you can actually use this equation to estimate maximum volume for that maximum surface area. And then you can estimate uh, mean depth by a ratio of maximum volume by maximum area. And um, because you don't know the shape of a lake, however, what we have done, we analyze different lakes in, in Alberta and we find out that the dominant lake types in Alberta is either parabolic or conic. 
So the value for m is two when a lake is parabolic or it could be three when a lake is conic. So you can use either any of those. And you can estimate maximum depth by multiplying the mean depth with that m. And from there, you can actually estimate the volume of a lake using this equation. And then you can finally plot volume versus depth. So let's give you an example. So this example, we have tried to estimate a relationship between depth and volume for Buck Lake. So again, the equation for maximum volume is this. So the maximum surface area for that lake is about 27.61 million meter square. So we can use this equation to estimate maximum volume, which has become about 161 million meter cube. And then you can estimate D mean, which is again, the ratio of this and that, which is about 5.83 meter. And if you assume M equals to two or three, you know, depending on the shape, you can find out the maximum depth. And then if it becomes parabolic, this is your equation. And if it's become conic, this would be your equation. And then you can plot V versus D. So here I'm showing exactly what we have done for Buck Lake. Now, because for Buck Lake, we do have data available. So this is just a verification of how this method works. You can see this blue dotted line, this blue line showing you the actual relationship between depth and volume. And then, you know, this maroon line with the square legend, this is showing you what would be the estimated, you know, volume based on the shape of the lake, which is parabolic. And this maroon line with triangular legend showing you the same relationship when you estimate or when you assume that your lake is conic. So again, this might not be ideal, but you know, when you have no other information available, this could be a method that you can use. So in part one, you learned the basic hydrologic theory of lake hydrology. And in part two, you also have seen some of the data source and also methods to estimate different components of lake water balance. In part three, I will try to explain you a real life example of lake water balance for Skeleton Lake in Alberta. So the lake is located 160 kilometer north of Edmonton, around here. So this is some basic information of the lake. Uh, the lake surface area is about eight kilometers square. The lake watershed area is about 40 kilometers square, which is about five times the lake surface area. The mean depth of the lake is about 6.5 meter. And that information is based on a bathymetric survey completed in August, 1965. And also the maximum depth of the lake is about 70 meter that is also based on the same bathymetric survey. So the reason we did a water balance study on this lake, because you know we received some complaint about declining water levels. So we actually went to the site and this is the photograph we took, I think sometimes in 2016. So before going into the details of the lake water balance, we wanted to revisit this demonstration the different components of the lake water balance that we explained in part one. So we need to know precipitation that falling on the lake. We need information on surface inflow, groundwater inflow, groundwater outflow, evaporation, net diversion, also surface outflow. So the first component is inflow, which is surface runoff. So this is Skeleton Lake and the blue shaded area is showing the lake surface area and the boundary, this purple line is showing the lake watershed. 
So, so there is no surface water monitoring station available within this lake watershed. However, we find out there are two stations around. One is over here, which is for that flat lake. And then one is over here, is the Pine Creek. So we actually use those two nearby water supply camera stations and then estimate the mean annual surface runoff for the lake, which is over here. And you can see it's from 1967 all the way to, I think, 2014. And this blue dotted line is showing the trend in surface runoff for that lake. Then we need um, geodetic precipitation falling on the lake. So for this purpose, we use actually ACIS interpolated gridded data that I showed earlier. And you can see this is a skeleton lake. It actually covered two grid. So what we have done, we downloaded data for both grids and then we try to make them in Evers way to represent the mean precipitation for the lake. And you can see the numbers. Again, for the same time frame, these are annual numbers, and you can see the trend is again going down. We did monitor the lake for a few years in terms of winter lake levels and we apply this methodology that I explained a little bit earlier in part one to estimate the groundwater flux. And then for evaporation what we have done again we downloaded climate data for these two grids and we use Morton's evaporation model to estimate lake evaporation. And this is how it actually looks like. You can see this, this dot showing mean annual lake evaporation. Again, for the same time frame, and you can see the trend is going up. Now, there are some water diversion information available for that lake. So I think I explained it earlier that there are two types of thing here. One is the water allocation and one is the water use. So for some times from 1985 to 2004, we actually have data for water use from this lake, which is like this. You can see this, this purple line. And then for 2005 and 2008, we have some partial data available for water use. Um, so we use a combination of water use and maximum water allocation for unreported licenses. Unreported license means the license that doesn't have information available for water use. We only have information for water allocation, which is the theoretical water use. And then from 2009 to 2014, we only have data for water allocation. So no water use data is available for that time. So we use the water allocation, which is the theoretical maximum water use. For the surface outflow, so this is what it looks like. So this side is the lake, and this size uh, is the downstream um, channel that flowing into the Amisk Lake. You can see there's a road here, uh, although you can see water, but this is just because there's beaver dam on the downstream side. And then we bring everything into a model. So the model um, platform is the whiskey modeling platform, which is, I think, water information system, Kisters International. So this is a model that we use internally. And you can see, different components of those incoming and outgoing water brought into this model. And this diagram I'm showing you again, the reddish lines, dots are showing the actual lake level measurements. 
and the black line is showing you the simulated lake levels based on those incoming and outgoing water. So they are pretty close. And then what we have done, we analyze the incoming water, which is this black line, and also the outgoing water in a community basis. And uh, what we find out that, you know, uh, the incoming water is getting getting lower compared to the outgoing water. So that basically creating this falling lake level issues. So um, in all these three uh, portions of my presentation, I try to explain to you why you need lake water balance information. Uh, why we need to study lake hydrology and how you actually um, get an idea of lake hydrology. So, um, you know, I, I can be in present for this lecture, but, you know, um, feel free to send me an email for any information you need in this regard, and I would be happy to answer those questions. So thank you very much.